So, um, the subject of today's uh, talk is all about Irish traditional music, and does anyone have experience in it? Familiar with it? Small bit? Okay, some people a small bit, other people a bit more. Um, I, um, basically, this is really a study that involves myself a lot, as well as a survey across North America. Um, well, North American continent, and it basically started off when I got a Fulbright uh, close to the US, worked at the Library of Congress, and uh, explored a collection of Irish traditional music, which was kind of like a, a dream job. You couldn't uh, imagine anything better for a, an Irish musician to go to America and, and work on stuff like that. But while I was there, um, I had some interns working with me on that project, and I decided to go and create a survey at the same time. Um, and try and get a little idea about what's going on on the North American continent uh, more generally. I've been going over to uh, San Francisco since 2003. Um, I've been playing music with a lot of people, mostly Irish immigrants who've been there since the 1980s, so it was a bit of an older crowd at the time. Um, and Irish traditional music that goes beyond it's the young people up to old age, um, different uh, people from all sorts of backgrounds. So the um, survey came about because of that, and then I decided that I wanted to really get a good idea of the musical landscape in the area. <coughs> <coughs> so the aim was to analyse how performers interact with Irish traditional music uh, and audio. So digital audio mostly, but just see what they're used to over the years. Um, some people had told me that they used to go to Ireland um, to kind of go back to the source and to get really kind of authentic Irish experience and uh, bring that back to America and then talk to their friends about how great it was in Ireland. But um, as we'll see later on, it actually changed a lot um, and it is changing. The younger uh, group of Irish musicians now are doing totally different things and it's less uh, Ireland centric. The responses, 528 um, responses over between 2019 to 2020. So it overlapped a bit with the pandemic, which was helpful to me, um, because otherwise it'd be completely out of date. Um, 206 female, 310 male, and three as non-binary or other. And then I tri triangulated that with six interviews during the pandemic, which is really helpful. Um, I was able to kind of qualify a lot of the results that were coming out from the survey itself. This is a picture of a group of people I got to know when I was living in Washington, D.C., and we used to play music together every week. So at the end, I performed and presented my um, project on uh, right in the centre of the library, bringing together digital experts, uh, people from Irish traditional music backgrounds, um, historians, and enthusiasts from all over the, that region. So it was quite, quite an interesting project. It's on YouTube if you want to see the, uh, the Library of Congress has a, a have held on to the actual recording of that. So, Irish traditional music, uh, just to give you a little bit more in-depth understanding about it, uh, it's a diverse, vibrant musical tradition that has become popular worldwide. Um, there's places, there's uh, clubs all over the world. It's, um, it's gone from being something that was just a hobby or uh, a backwater sort of a music into something that's seen everywhere as a very popular genre of music. In fact, if you go outside of Ireland anywhere, People will tell you like, that's one of their favourite things about Ireland um, a lot of the time. Um, might be a little bit biased there. Performances range from informal sessions, so that's, you might be familiar with that. Go down to the local pub, Sinead down there has 14 a week, and people play there every single night. Um, really informal, uh, but you have to know your stuff. You have to be fairly well tuned into what happens um, in repertoire, in terms of ethics, in terms of... Um, how to approach a session, um, and a colleague of mine, uh, Jesse Colley, actually wrote a book on that just last year called Becoming an Irish Musician. And if anyone here knows uh, Communities of Practice, um, she does a really good job of, of challenging the Communities of Practice in that context. Um, so, found out Irish and American experiences are largely similar, but there are a number of key differences. Um, Irish music's kind of had a resurgence since the 1960s and out there in, in the US and in places like Tokyo, New Zealand, Africa, um, all of those places, there's a lot of people seamlessly crossing the boundaries of professionalism. So basically, there's amateurs working with professional artists who want to stay just with 100,000 people. They turn up in a session next week and play music together. <coughs> so there's a really vibrant online community as well. Um, the session.org is the name of uh, a website that's probably one of the 
older web 1.0 websites that's survived the test of time and it's now one of the most um, interactive and vibrant communities for Irish traditional music where you can share tunes and you can share recordings and an awful lot of discussion. <coughs> um, as I was talking about Colleen, she has done, uh, she did her PhD in the music department here in 2013 and then she's just published her book in 2020. Uh, Francis Ward has also studied Irish traditional music and technology. So these people are looking at um, nascent technologies and how people are using these technologies in their um, ways of uh, learning Irish music. So it's mostly music education and what they call enculturation. Enculturation is kind of like this immersion into the music um, and kind of like an osmosis learning of how to interact with people. So very much the community of practice and learning the ropes as you go. Um, in the US, there have been some studies on Irish traditional music in that region itself. Um, it was only focusing on uh, the United States, and they, they've done some surveys, but uh, a lot of it is to do with uh, specifically learning. So it doesn't really cross over into technology a lot. So I kind of found my chance here, and I said, maybe I can look at um, North America as a continent and ask, um, ask the communities out there how they use technology. Um, some ethnomusicology stuff here. Uh, basically, in ethnomusicology, music is sometimes not seen as just pure music. It involves everyone from the person on the door taking the tickets, uh, the person who is lifting in the piano, uh, the person who's singing. Everything is all part of the same event, and so it's a verb to music, to be ethnomusicking. Um, then we have this idea came to me that I would take performers in the widest sense, I wouldn't just look at musicians and say, you're the ones I want to talk to. I would take enthusiasts and broadcasters and performers all together, and I would ask those questions in that open way so that I, I could get as wide a possible understanding about it. Ruth Finnegan has written in 1987 about ordinary musicians. Um, this is a very big thing in Irish music. As I was saying, amateurs are really um, prevalent on the scene and they're every bit as respected as a person who's on stage at a concert. So Rube Finnegan's ideas around localised music and people playing as amateurs that they can be extraordinary is uh, an angle that was taken uh, for a theor theoretical framework. Uh, so I went out and I contacted people when I was in the Library of Congress in the session.org, uh, concertina.net, Chiff and Fipple, Mandolin Cafe. Um, some of these are already contacts in my network, so it was easy to kind of get in there. Um, organizers across, organizations across the continent, is, do people know Cultus? Yeah, so Cultus is fairly big in Ireland, but it's massive worldwide. Um, and luckily, the United States and uh, Canada had a lot of different uh, Cultus organizations. So I just um, would contact them, and most of the time they would <coughs> gladly have out. I shared it on Twitter and Facebook, um, and the cool thing was, when I was working on surveymonkey.com, I was able to actually see the amount of people who were filling in the survey from Twitter and Facebook, and it was actually a fairly sizable amount of people that otherwise wouldn't be on the, these other groups. Telephone calls, um, a lot of the time I found that was what a preferred method for some people, so I was trying to include people as much as possible. One thing I didn't do was I didn't uh, check it for uh, people with disabilities, which was a major problem um, that I'll kind of discuss in a, an upcoming article. So it was a paid subscription, fairly expensive, by the way, um, if you're ever going to use it. Um, if you want to get the best full benefit of it, um, it's, it's well worth it, but it's actually fairly expensive. Um, and it's the first study that focused primarily on digital audio in the US, um, and we get interactions with people, um, how they actually use it um, throughout their life and how they now use it as well. Um, so I was try really trying to get a whole gamut of um, people's interactions with it. Um, and it was a plethora of resources used. Then I went and took um, about six different interview participants as wide range as possible in age, in location, um, in connection to the music itself, and in gender as well. Um, so there was, um, I wasn't able to find anyone outside of uh, male and female, but um, with a bit more work I could have done that, so it's also another limitation. Um, quite interesting with the interviews um, that I could triangulate that with the survey and really get some understanding about it. The main um, theory I was coming from with this was autoethnography, and you've probably heard of this one uh, a bit, yeah, big one here in DH. 
Um, in ethnomusicology, it's become a very uh, important part of how we think about ourselves in the discipline as well. Um, but the big thing for me here is the idea of things not being fixed um, or immovable. Um, so, as I was saying, living in San Francisco, finding out about some of the older crowd, yes, they did want to connect with Ireland a lot, and yes, they did like archival recordings, um, and I would take that for granted at the time. But the cool thing about autoethnography is that I could just kind of put this out there and say, yes, this is what I was thinking at the time, um, but then through traveling mostly to the East Coast and meeting younger performers, then I got a whole uh, better understanding of how things happened. Um, North American performers uh, starting Irish traditional music at a young age. In Ireland, um, a lot of people start at the age of even five, six, seven, and they go through a whole system. It's like ticking boxes here. But in America, you can imagine the distances are longer. It's harder for people to be involved in the community. Community is uh, it's a more important thing, but it's a not prevalent thing in that space. So they have different ways of interacting uh, with the music itself. Very small pie charts here. I might have to update this one. This is the first uh, D3JS. All my stuff was done in D3JS, which was, um, it's taking me a bit more time, but I'll be able to put it on my website at the end as well, um, as an example. Um, okay, so simple questions like, if using the internet has a big impact on your musical life, how has that happened? Um, and as we all know, like using YouTube, using different resources online, of course it has an impact on any part of your life. Um, you go and find out whatever you want um, and it enriches a lot of what we do. There's not very many people in the responses saying that it hasn't helped them in any way at all and I'd be very surprised if they said it did. Another question I had was um, if Ireland was an important thing or if they had went to Ireland or things like, I was asking two or three questions like that, but this one was asking what places were formative in their musical development? Um, and it was quite interesting. This was made in Carto.com, uh, uh, Um And you can see a lot of the connections here are actually going straight to Ireland. All right. There's a lot of people who have actually traveled to Ireland over the years. But the really interesting part for me was there's all these connections in, in the West. I and mean, once you get to know Americans in this part of America, there's a lot of crossover between the West and, and the Midwest area. Um, in the East, this is the traditional story that's been told. The Irish immigrants came over, they stayed in New York and Boston, and we all hear that, those stories. But you don't hear a lot about um, up here in Canada, people down here in Tallahassee, maybe, uh, down around Texas. Um, these people are living in uh, communities who actually do play Irish music on a constant basis and relate to it a lot um, together. So it's quite interesting to see um, the whole spread of where these people are coming from. These are actually down in you have Mexico here, down into South America. So Americans, I think it's a, something like, on average, they move three times in their lifetime or something like that, or something more like, like that. But um, obviously, this is a really um, different type of community than what we have in, in Ireland in some ways. Um, so another part of it was to find out what instruments they played. And of course, we have a massive, big, different type of uh, viewpoint here. Um, Ren fairs, Renaissance fairs are big things in America, and there's a funny thing of a crossover between the Renaissance fair and musicians' instruments that they play. So very often you might see things like the uh, clavichord or um, hurdy gurdy or uh, dulcimers and stuff like that, and they actually get in here too. Um, the dance as well was included, so there's people with dance experience in different places. So I continue in that vein, and this is a like, zoomed-in snapshot of a, a D3 tree map, which gives the amount of um, experience people have in different genres. Um, so there's like something like 200 different genres here on the right-hand side that people have experience in. So Irish traditional musicians in America cannot be put into a box, literally, but they are here as in they have all these different experiences. And the prevalent one by far was uh, classical music, and that goes back to their um, teenage days um, in school, in high school, and in band and stuff like that. So you get a lot of jazz music, and American folk, bluegrass, and stuff like that. So you can really start to get a picture of how their experiences come together um, as people in this space. I then started to move away from asking such kind of 
personal questions about music and then moving a bit further into um, the digital. Um, and it's quite interesting to see from like, email is obviously still the most prevalent one and um, this question could have been reframed as said, have you used, it could have been are you using, might see it, might get a totally different response there. Um, the difference with Ireland, there's been a survey done by Ward in Ireland and this Ertrad mailing list is a really big one. If anyone knows Irish music in America, um, the Americans were way ahead of the Irish in terms of sharing stuff um, back in the 1990s. The Ertrad, Irish trad mailing list was a massive one where people used to share um, tunes and they'd share um, thoughts and discussions on this mailing list. The uh, session dialog came on later on. Other ones that are very interesting are the um, Google Drive, Dropbox. Um, obviously, lots of people still use Dropbox and, and have used it, and Google Drive. Um, but the session.org is a really important one for Americans, too. So where they're trying to find out about Irish traditional music and learn more. On what devices? Um, PC, laptop is no surprise. Mobile, cell phone, recordings, um, all the way down to one that hit me was the vinyl record 78 pm player or the 77 people but the cd player is a massive one still and one of the reasons for that could be the fact that you can actually read a lot of the notes and and read out the history in the background of the music from that so a lot of americans are, are a lot of north americans are still using uh cds and cd players i started to move into questions that were a bit more closely related to the Library of Congress, um, because I really wanted to find out how archives could improve their digital presence, or what could they do for these people in order to make a better, um, make a better experience for them. Um, so then I started asking which um, collector or archive related websites have they visited, and this was just to basically find out um, are they actually very much aware of any of these websites. The Irish Traditional Music Archive is by far the most popular one. Um, and I was really interested to see that there's, there's ones here that the British Library Sound collections are not very well known at all. So reflecting more on my own um, misinterpretation of Americans as well, is that um, a lot of them are evolving a lot as well. They don't, they don't just stay on, on archive websites a lot and trawl through them. They actually um, they go with whatever is becoming the more popular one. The Irish Traditional Music Archive was by far the most popular with the Irish Tune Info one, which is an American website. Um, <coughs> Collectors of Irish Traditional Music um, was another one I was trying to figure out if people were interested in uh, collections and collectors. And I found Alan Lomax is a really famous one. He's been in the media mostly over the last uh, half decade or half century. Uh, Captain Francis O'Neill basically wrote the Bible of Irish Jews. Uh, Mick Maloney was one of these spokespersons for Irish America. So most people will be really familiar with those. And then there's a massive drop-off to someone like Alan DeBoer, who was the main collector for the Library of Congress. And he went around America looking for uh, cultural artifacts from uh, Irish people and immigrants and stuff like that. But no, no one in America really knows an awful lot about Alan DeBoer and the work that he's done. Save if it was on folkwave records and places like that. <coughs> um, so trying to dig a bit deeper into that then to see why were people not that in, uh, knowledgeable about it. Um, some people just prefer person-to-person -person interaction. They don't want to be part of that world um, of nerdy kind of archive people who are wanting to find out um, rare versions of stuff. A lot of people weren't aware of the resources as well. Um, lack of time because it's such a difficult thing to get to the Library of Congress and then some of their collections are very hard to navigate. So if you go onto the website catalog.loc.gov, you'll see that it's very hard to actually kind of experience all the holdings that are there. Um, in comparison to that, the itma.ie website is really accessible, really easy to um, navigate around. So there's a big, big DH question there. Sheer volume of material available online was a big one as well. Irish traditional music is everywhere on the internet. You can you can find information for any tune. If you're looking up the name of any tune, you can have all its background and everything that's there. So sometimes people just don't have um, the wherewithal to go through all the volumes of information that's there. So does that ask us a question about digital asset management? Um, I don't know. So then there's a few more insights to explore. I asked about 40 questions in total. Um, with the 580, 528 responses, um, I started thinking then about 
could I compare usage of digital audio between young people and old people? I know James did an interesting one on uh, his article about programming, uh, coding in, in the US, where older people seem to be doing a bit more coding than, than younger. Um, in Irish traditional music, it might be that way. Um, the Eartrad mailing list was set up by a volunteer group in the US, and they continually maintain it. MandolinCafe.com is actually um, maintained by a person who does it on a volunteer basis, and that generation of people were this kind of leading light in the web 1.0 world, where they were um, they would take massive collections and they would transcribe every single tune for no money at all, just for the sake of doing it as a volunteer. Um, so the amount of time spent listening to Irish traditional music during the week, they gave me responses on that. Um, might be interesting, I'm not sure um, if it will come in anywhere on it. And then sight reading was a very interesting one too. Um, notation seemed to be something that people were familiar with. If you come from a classical background, it's very easy to get uh, notation. And I, from my own experience in the US, a lot of uh, people have notation and it's kind of frowned upon in the oral tradition because it's seen as a crutch in, uh, for learning. So a lot of people kind of stand away from that. Um, I was trying to find out then with the tri triangulation at the end. What time have we got? OK. Uh, if there was a uh, relationship that was consistent here in the data, um, and this person came back to me and, and was talking about the connection with Ireland and if that um, is a big thing for younger people in America. And actually, no, um, there is a, a tradition already in New York, already in um, Boston, already in uh, Chicago, where younger people see the forebears that were in those cities as the important people, not the people in Ireland. So there's a total disconnect in a way, or maybe an evolving or an emerging scene that's happening with younger people, which is really, um, it's quite interesting. I'll come back to that in a second. Um, okay, so they cite different areas of the continent as formative um, in their development. There's wide-ranging uh, genres that they've experienced performing. Typical involvement uh, begins much later than expected, than I expected. The internet is an important learning tool. A plethora of resources were identified. So I, they identified up to something like 60 different um, resources online, that, and a lot of them I didn't know were there before. Um, some people were coming back saying, can you please send me all those resources? I want to check them out. So that was kind of a, a very helpful part of the survey. Archives are important, but not for regular engagement. So some people were saying to me, um, I just think that the archive is important just for preserving stuff, but I don't really want to go near it. <laughs> Um, and that was like a lot of people that go to sessions every week, they're so used to that in-person interaction in the moment uh, playing that they're not as interested in the stuff that's being preserved. Um, perhaps cheap music is an important resource for archives. There's a really good tool on itma.ie um, called PORT, P-O-R-T, it's the Irish word for jig or tune, and uh, you can go onto it and you can actually play a tune and learn it by ear and then you can also um, read it. And a lot of those tunes have been transcribed from collections and it's sort of like a definitive source now for people to learn music uh, from in the Irish context. Um, yeah, so it's a, sort of a changing experience. The big takeaway I'm getting from this is there's a changing experience happening in, in the US um, and it's ever evolving. Um, there's two different things happening at the moment I can see that are really making this um, change happen. Um, in ethnomusicology and on the ground as well. Um, so the first one here is a friend of mine, Joey Abarta, he's a, he's a master Ilan Piper. Um, and he actually grew up in LA. Um, he became a superb Ilan Piper. He moved to Boston and now he runs his own festival called the Patrick J. Tootie Memorial Weekend. So he's celebrating this Piper, but this Piper, he was born in Ireland, but none of his upbringing was in Ireland. It was all completely in America. He became this really famous piper back in the 1920s in vaudeville, on, in the vaudeville scene. And uh, Joey is actually bringing together this memorial of this person, but there's no sense of Irishness in it at all. It's a very, very little amount of um, reference to anything Irish, um, save that he's just talking about some of the music. Um, having said that, Joey does have a really good connection to Ireland. He's been over a good few times, but it's interesting that he doesn't kind of keep relating it back to the motherland or whatever they might say sometimes. 
So it's organized as well for a lot for American musicians, um, and it's all almost like if anyone knows, Bill and Pipers have their own kind of scene that goes on. It's called the Chinole, which is a gathering, and uh, hundreds of pipers come together for festivals in different places. But this is the first time that there's one dedicated to an actual person in America, and it's um, quite interesting to see it taken off. Um, Tess Leminski's book was uh, quite a fascinating book that came out there um, in 2020. And on the Journal of Music, there was a this fascinating article as well which asks, um, should we separate Irish traditional music from our sense of Irishness? So what she was saying in this book was that Tribe Nation is full of this idea that um, nationalism is kind of like, uh, has kind of a hold on music itself and that kind of denies people from the outside on the fringes access to that world. Because the simple question that a lot of Americans would get, um, and I've seen this a lot, is um, so, have you got relations, relations in Ireland? And people would be like, no, I just live in America. <laughs> so it's kind of a, it's an interesting kind of conundrum that goes on for Americans that way and how do they find themselves on the scene and internationally. Okay, so those were the ideas I was introducing. I'm sort of like three quarters of the way through uh, an article for the Society of Ethnomusicology and I'm getting very close now to kind of wrapping them up, but I'm still open to ideas and, and shoot downs, if anyone wants to shoot me down. Um, the, uh, the evidence, I know there's like kind of two things going on here. It's looking at digital audio, but it's also looking at the background of the musicians. And there might be a little jump from the idea that a musician like doesn't see Ireland as super important vocally, right? and what they produce in terms of a festival or a book or something like that. Is there too much of a leap there? And is that uh, further investigation <coughs> that might be needed? Those are some of the areas where I'm, I'm kind of still on, on the edge of it and not fully sure about. Um, future work as well, I suppose that's really big thing here. It's sort of like opening up the research to loads of different opportunities. And it's only started in that area. The, I the Anglo Irish story uh, in America was typically, as I was saying, New York and Boston emigration and those melting pots. But we're starting to see a lot more changes happen in the literature on um, people who are in places that were so kind of remote. Uh, one good example I found in the Library of Congress when I was searching the collections was, there was this guy born in Utah in 1903. He moved to Montana in 1906. And then he moved to Cork in 1920. He moved back to New York then. Then he moved to, uh, in during the war, to Richmond, California. He moved back to Montana. He produced an album at the age of 97, and at the age of 103 he died. Like, that's, you know, the story of Irish America is just completely blown out of the water with those things. And there's loads of those examples of those stories that go across um, all these experiences, but we don't really get that in uh, our thinking, uh, or any, any of our stories and narratives that have gone before. Um, so. Yeah, it could be very controversial, but it could also be very helpful to the research. Well, that's it. Thank you.